Bruce. My name is Jörg Vorwick. I'm Director for Central and Eastern Europe at the German Marshall Fund, and I have the pleasure of chairing this discussion today. Now, the issue of sanctions or of EU and Western restrictive punitive measures uh, against governments and countries is obviously of very particular currency today. Uh, if we only look at the last three months, then an entire wave of uh, sanctions of restrictions has been imposed on Russia uh, over its war against Ukraine by the EU, but also by a broader community of uh, Western and democratic uh, countries, the US included and uh, many others. Uh, and what we've seen in the course of the last three, uh, three months in the, uh, uh, as an accompaniment to this, uh, to this wave of sanctions is obviously a debate that, uh, that raises a whole number of questions. Um, there are questions about how sanctions need to be designed. There are questions about whether or not they are effective at all. There are questions whether they can be limited uh, in their impact to those who really are responsible for what you would like to punish. Uh, and what the kind of fallout is on citizens, on societies at large. Um, there are questions about uh, whether sanctions can have a short-term impact or whether they really uh, unfold an impact only in the, in the long run. Uh, and of course, there is always the question uh, whether or not we, as those imposing sanctions, uh, are able to sustain them uh, over time. So these are all these are all questions that I think are very very relevant in this current debate and in the context of uh, of Russia's war against Ukraine. But uh, there are also questions that I think have accompanied sanctions debates uh, basically for decades. And a country that has a particularly long history uh, um, with sanctions by the EU and others uh, is Belarus, uh, a smaller country in Eastern Europe, a neighbor of Russia and the European Union, uh, a country that uh, has developed in an authoritarian way for the last 25 years, and that for that period uh, has been subject to uh, various waves and formats of, uh, of EU sanctions, which have been uh, imposed against Belarus and the Lukashenko regime that's, that rules there. Uh, on varying grounds, uh, typically uh, in response to human rights abuses in the country, but more recently also in response to uh, security threats that basically uh, Belarus uh, uh, poses. Uh, so given this broader debate on, uh, uh, on sanctions by the EU and others uh, uh, today, I think it's quite instructive to look at that, uh, uh, at that case study of, uh, of Belarus um, which is also one of Russia's few remaining allies, which is also implicated in the war, uh, basically party to, to the war against Ukraine. Uh, so this is, uh, this is basically a wealth of experience that we have gathered on the example of, uh, of Belarus that I think is quite relevant for our broader discussions uh, today. Now, to take such a closer look at this particular case, we're very fortunate uh, that uh, GMF has just been able to publish a pretty substantial policy paper on this uh, on this issue, and the author is with us today, Yulia Medvedskaya, uh, whom I am very happy to to welcome on this call, and who will give us a a, a sense of her findings, also some recommendations that uh, that are based on her research into Belarus and the EU sanctions as they have evolved vis-a-vis -vis this country uh, over time. Julia has spent the last year as a non-resident fellow with GMF within the Rethink CE fellowship program that we, uh, that we have here. Uh, and within that fellowship, she conducted the research that led to the paper that uh, has just been published at GMF. My colleagues will uh, post the link to that uh, paper in a minute. Uh, Julia is currently a researcher uh, at the Chair of Law and Artificial Intelligence at Tübingen University here in Germany and also a research fellow at the Hague Program on International Cybersecurity. Uh, Julia, I'm very, very happy that you are on this call with us today. Uh, and congratulations, first and foremost, on this most recent publication uh, of yours. I also have the pleasure to welcome uh, two further speakers and experts on the topic. Uh, Celia Chalet uh, is a senior academic assistant at the Department of European Legal Studies at the College of Europe in Bruges and a PhD researcher at the University of Ghent, with a PhD topic that, again, uh, is focused on EU sanctions, uh, especially as they have been adopted in the response to the Russian war against Ukraine. Welcome, Celia. 
And we have Dr. Clara Portella, who's a very seasoned expert uh, on EU and multilateral sanctions. She teaches political science at the Law School of the University of Valencia in Spain. Uh, she has held various positions, uh, including at Singapore Management University and at the EU Institute for Strategic Studies. And she's also taught at numerous universities uh, across Europe. Her research focus, you guessed it, is sanctions, along with uh, topics like arms control and EU foreign policy. Uh, welcome, Clara. It's a pleasure to have you on this uh, on this call. Uh, now, let's go into the uh, the actual discussion presentations that we have before that. But unfortunately, I also have a couple of technical things that I need to share before we can actually go into the substance. Uh, first, uh, you will have noticed that the session is being recorded. Uh, we will then uh, publish the recording on the GMF YouTube channel. Uh, as for the agenda, we will first hear from uh, Julia uh, on her main findings uh, from her paper, but I certainly encourage you also to, following in the session, read the actual paper because there's much more substance in it than certainly Julia will be able to squeeze into a couple of minutes of presentation here. Uh, then we will hear from Celia and from Clara uh, with their comments, with their additional perspectives. Uh, and then finally, we will open for uh, questions from you all. Uh, we will ask you to post those questions in the chat function, and then I will relay the questions uh, to our three speakers. I hope for your understanding that we uh, don't allow the questions to be asked sort of uh, in person and, uh, and audio. So I encourage you, as you hear the presentations, the comments from our speakers, uh, to uh, post questions already so that we can go into the discussion afterwards uh, right away. This ends my introductory part. Uh, we're delighted to have so many of you uh, in the audience. Uh, this is a very solid uh, uh, interest that you all display in this, uh, in this topic. So we're much looking forward uh, to this discussion. But for now, let's hear from Julia on the main findings from her research and paper. Julia, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Jörg, for your kind introduction. I would like to thank everyone who is joining us tonight, and also I would like to thank both the discussants who kindly accepted my invitation to comment on, uh, on this paper. And last but not least, uh, thank you very much to the German Marshall Fund for giving me this opportunity to conduct this research on EU sanctions against Belarus and also for all the assistance and support throughout the whole process uh, up until the publication. And now I will move to, to the core of, uh, of this topic, to the, to the substance of my research. I must say that um, I got interested in the question of the design of sanctions um, a few years ago. I was reading quite a lot of scholarly work. And uh, um, this topic attracted my attention for two rounds of considerations. Like, first of all, I was thinking that with the way how the European Union designs its sanctions, it could potentially also increase its own bargaining power and also potentially extract some uh, concessions from those that are being targeted, including uh, countries or um, entities, um, individuals. Uh, my second round of considerations relate to the fact that the way how the European Union designs its sanctions could also increase the resilience of EU restrictive measures, specifically when those are being challenged in front of the Court of Justice. And we know that there are quite a lot of precedents when sanctions were struck down by the Court of Justice because they did not comply with due process uh, requirements. And for this reason, I decided to go into uh, different um, aspects uh, into different elements of the EU sanctions uh, design uh, that you can see uh, on this table. Of course, I would like to make a remark that, uh, in my opinion, this table is not exhaustive, but it still um, um, includes the most, element, element, uh, the most important elements, in my opinion. So first of all, there is triggering situation, why sanctions are being enacted. And the triggering situation is directly interlinked with type of um, uh, sanctions that will be adopted by the European Union. When we say sanctions, um, it's a kind of it's a broad concept. So what does it mean exactly? And those sanctions they can include 
um, measures under common foreign and security policy, such as asset freezes um, and travel bans, but they, call, uh, they can also include other types of measures, uh, such as uh, export import restrictions, withdrawal of trade preferences, or um, of uh, development cooperation advantages. There are also several sectoral sanctions. Then there are also targets. Who is being targeted? Uh, for this, the council has to uh, lay down listing criteria and also accompany those by reasons for listing. Then there are also objectives um, what the European Union exactly wants to achieve with its sanctions, because sanctions are not meant to last forever. They're meant to be uh, either reviewed, either suspended, either lifted once those objectives are being fulfilled. Then there is also the question of evidence, which is very important because the council cannot include everyone in its sanctions list. It must make sure that at least one reason for listing is being substantiated with sufficient evidence. Then there are also conditions for review, which are being, in my opinion, still linked to objectives of EU sanctions, but they are more addressed to those that are being lifted so that those who are target, uh, those who are being listed. So those who are targeted, they must know what uh, they have to do, what conditions they have to fulfill in order for those sanctions against them to be lifted. And when it comes to the triggering situation, there are some interesting observations to make with respect to the case of Belarus. When I was writing this paper, the link between the triggering situation and the type of sanctions adopted by the European Union was not that obvious. But then with the uh, all the events are unfolding, I could clearly see that uh, in the beginning, the European Union was adopting sanctions against Belarus only in response to internal political situation in the country. So these were cases of post disappearances and obstruction of justice uh, at the end of 90s. Then there were cases of um, multiple election and referendum frauds marked by uh, violence, but everything changes in 2029, 21, when the European Union starts adopting more robust and comprehensive measures in response to, uh, the, Belar to the Belarusian regime becoming a threat to the EU's and regional security, uh, specifically with this case of forced landing of a uh, Ryanair plane and then instrumentalization of migrants. And uh, the most recent example is support of Belarusian regime for Russian aggression against Ukraine. And this change in a, in a trigger, in a triggering situation impacts also the type of measures which are being taken by the European Union. We can, I think all the sanctions researchers uh, must enjoy the case of Belarus because there is a broad range of uh, sanctions uh, being adopted against Belarus. Uh, something to mention is that most of those sanctions, there were targeted measures on the common foreign security policy, and this was directly linked to this idea of hitting the least possible, the population uh, of, of Belarus. So sanctions, they are meant to target those who are responsible for taking decisions in, uh, in, uh, in Belarus. Uh, since 2021, we can see that there is broadening of scope and type of EU sanctions um, uh, against Belarus that the European Union um, uh, started enacting sectoral economic sanctions uh, against several sectors of the Belarusian economy, potash, oil, goods used for the production of tobacco products. It's interesting to note that at the moment, uh, the potash sector allegedly performs in Belarus only at 30% of its capacities, whereas our oil sector performs at approximately 50% uh, of these capacities. There are also flight bans, and those measures are much more comprehensive. So if we um, look at flight bans, of course, they are not that targeted uh, anymore. Uh, there are financial sanctions, ban on road transport between the European Union and Belarus, and uh, the ban on the road transport between the EU and Belarus allegedly has more consequences for the private sector of Belarus. There is also this victim of four Belarusian banks. Another question is who is on the EU sanctions list? We know that those sanctions lists and they're being presented by uh, the member states and by the high representative for common foreign and security policy to the council that uh, then votes by unanimity. Sanctions proposals can be also made by the Belarusian uh, democratic forces, but they serve just as a mere guidance. They're not compulsory to be taken into consideration because otherwise, otherwise as one EU official said, 
those sanctions listed against Belarus would include over 1,000 names. Uh, and uh, uh, this was not desirable, but now we see that uh, sanctions against Russia actually include over 1,000 names. So there are listing criteria and statement of reasons because why someone is on the sanctions list, like for instance, the company Synesis that was providing Belarusian authorities with a, a surveillance platform that helped to identify those who protested against fraudulent presidential elections. We can see that there is also broadening of listing criteria. There are more and more um, activities that are being sanctioned, such as instrumentalization of uh, migrants, for instance. And there is also granularity of EU sanctions. So the EU starts with targeting some high level officials, then it moves to uh, companies, uh, then it moves to sectoral uh, uh, and more impactful measures. If you look at those who are being sanctioned now, we see that uh, there are a lot of members of Ministry of Internal Affairs, also those from the judicial system, Ministry of Defense, and this choice of targets is quite easy to explain because it's easy to collect evidence against them, which is not the case when we deal with sanctions against uh, propagandists or um, against uh, business persons. Then another aspect of the sanctions design, these are objectives. It's what the European Union wants to achieve. And um, this is kind of controversial because um, on the one hand, sometimes those objectives are not clearly articulated. And on the other hand, sometimes it's not clear how to, uh, what yardstick must, must be used in order to, uh, um, to make a conclusion that those objectives have been fulfilled. And if we look at uh, previous sanctions against Belarus, we can see that in most of the cases, uh, that's the European Union who had to make concessions because at the end of the day, the Belarusian regime did not change uh, uh, it was ready to uh, comply with some requirements, but the political system uh, in, in Belarus has, has not involved as such. Then evidence for sanctions. Now the European, the Council relies on open source data. On the one hand, that's great, because uh, if sanctions are being challenged in court, uh, then the Council can disclose this uh, data um, in court proceedings. But on the other hand, it also presents some difficulties because as we can understand, open source data is as re reliable as its source. And we don't know for sure whether those sources can be trusted. And to some extent, this might undermine uh, EU, uh, EU sanctions. On the other hand, it brings also under spotlight those journalists that conduct um, investigations, for instance, of assets of, uh, of uh, Lukashenko's family. Uh, we also know that there were 14 cases, um, 14 judgments delivered by the Court of Justice in the past. And in most of the cases, the Court of Justice struck down uh, sanctions against Belarusian businessmen and Belarusian journalists because it did not find a sufficient link between those that, that were sanctioned and the uh, support or benefit uh, for or from the Belarusian regime. Like for instance, paying taxes or operating in the state control sector of economy does not uh, uh, qualify as supporting the regime. Then there are also conditions for review. Uh, the, in most of the cases, they, they are included in uh, um, the council decisions and sometimes they might be also inserted in some other documents, uh, for instance, in council conclusions when the council articulates what must be done uh, by the Belarusian authorities in order for sanctions to be lifted. And here, um, two questions might be asked, whether those conditions, whether they must be straightforward or probably open-ended in order to allow for a little bit more flexibility. And then sanctions can be also selectively suspended select, um, by the Court of Justice. So the Court of Justice can uh, proceed with uh, selective delistings. And we know already that six Belarusian company, uh, companies and run one, one Russian oligarch, who is the, one of the biggest um, uh, investors in Belarus, they're contesting their listings because they consider that those sanctions are illegal and they do not uh, uh, present uh, sufficient um, evidence to justify them uh, being listed. And I would like to end this presentation with just a few observations on the future of EU sanctions. First of all, on the question of national bias and incomplete centralization, both on ex-ante and ex-post level, 
because on ex ante level, we see how it's difficult to uh, enact sanctions. Um, uh, the most recent case is uh, uh, the opposition of Hungary, for instance, to, to Russian sanctions. And on ex post level, we see to what extent it might be difficult to make sure that uh, sanctions are being effectively implemented across the European Union. Even though there are uh, quite a lot of efforts done uh, in, in, the, in, the in the last weeks in this respect, and even though there is a DG um, Director General FISMA, which is responsible for the implementation, for or, overview of the implementation of sanctions across the European Union, uh, the EU system still stays decentralized and uh, the uh, member states, they um, keep uh, the last word uh, in their own hands. Uh, also, I would like to uh, bring attention to the necessity to conduct a sort of prior impact assessment of EU restrictive measures, uh, because some of them, they might have humanitarian consequences and they might also impact the future development of EU Belarus relations. In my opinion, the European Union might, must think strategically and also most probably not uh, equate um, uh, Russia to Belarus, Belarus to Russia and still make a differentiation, differentiation between two countries. Because many people in Brussels might be tempted to consider Belarus as one case together with Russia, whereas I do believe that Belarus requires a different type of expertise. Then I also stress that the European Union must have realistic objectives. Of course, we all would like to see some uh, radical changes in the Belarusian political system, but uh, at the moment, this is not really feasible. And I do believe that the European Union has to exert pressure, for instance, in order to release and rehabilitate uh, political prisoners. And now we have more than 1,000 political prisoners in Belarus. Also, I would like to advise the EU to be to have a more um, a clearer communication and also explain better to the Belarusian society uh, its sanctions policy because there are quite a lot of myths and misunderstandings. Like some in the Belarusian society must think that uh, sanctions uh, will change the, the regime, and we know that uh, this rarely happens. And my last suggestion would be uh, to uh, uh, advise the European Union to preserve its own leverage, uh, uh, specifically not lift sanctions too early, or in case if there are some discussions, uh, specifically if there is this uh, bargaining uh, with respect to transporting uh, Ukrainian wheat through the Belarusian territory. So um, I think that uh, suspending sanctions uh, might be a, be a better solution because if they're suspended, they can be reintroduced uh, uh, again. And this would uh, be better in line with EU's uh, own objectives. And thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you so much, Julia. This was a bit of a tour de force, of course. Um, I mean, you managed within sort of very few minutes to pack a very sort of complex topic uh, into a very compact uh, presentation. I also have to say, as someone who's uh, who's been working with and on Belarus for many years, uh, I find it surprising that uh, that there are very few sort of comprehensive and compact uh, uh, treatments of the sanctions issue uh, uh, in relation to Belarus, despite the fact that this is a very old story. So uh, I think this is also something that is uh, very, very helpful to all of us who are working on uh, uh, Belarus specifically, uh, because it's a, uh, it's a fantastic overview of the state of affairs development so far. And obviously uh, it raises a whole number of very practical uh, questions. Um, I'd like to pass it on to uh, Celia now. Uh, I guess Celia will slightly sort of broaden the range of uh, or perspective here uh, to go uh, beyond uh, Belarus somewhat. This is uh, fully desired, obviously, because we all understand that uh, this is a, a broader question uh, and certainly also one that that is particularly relevant to to other parts, especially also of Eastern Europe and players there. So. Uh, Celia, over to you for your comments on what Julia said, but also your own perspectives on the issue. 
Thank you very much. And uh, thank you very much, Julia, to this very good uh, presentation and uh, paper. I think indeed, as it, as it has been said, it, they come as a very, at a very timely moment where we are really at the turning point in the sanctions practice. There's a lot of developments. And frankly, even, even for people who follow it on a daily basis, it's been quite the hassle to, to keep track of everything. It's a full-time job, really. Uh, so the presentation provides a good overview of the sanctions against Belarus, but also of sanctions in general, the current trends and how, you know, and Belarus is indeed a good example of the diversified range of, of restrictive measures that the, the EU can adopt. Uh, it also, the paper shows also very nicely this, this need uh, for crucial, uh, broader fundamental reflections on the current EU sanctions practice, especially because of the turning point. I mean, We've seen the numerous developments that have been that have been occurring. We've seen also, for example, the ongoing discussions on the confiscation of assets. So we can see that the EU is also thinking of taking things to another level to 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 um, how to say deepen the enforcement of restrictive measures. Uh, the EU is acting very fast. It's publishing communications, the proposals for directives, and it's difficult sometimes to have a clear overview of what's going on. So we need to really to take that step back and try to draw the lessons of the current uh, and past sanctions practice. Uh, we've also seen uh, that there's, as you mentioned, Julia, this case law that is going to be arriving before the Court of Justice. We've already have, I think, 20, more than 20 cases uh, brought by Russians and uh, Belarusian applicants. Uh, five days ago, we had the hearing of uh, Russia Today's France versus Council before the Court of Justice. And unsurprisingly, the focus was put during the discussions on uh, fundamental rights and due process on, on the one hand. So to what extent are the sanctions and that th these specific sanctions, so prohibition of uh, you know the diffusion of, of, of Russia today in Sputnik, for example, how much, is, how, to what extent is that complying with fundamental rights, but also the question of proportionality up until how far can the EU go, how to remain proportional, how to you know pro properly implement sanctions that are necessary and are uh, targeted to the uh, precise objectives of the sanctions. So indeed, the, the, this is part, this paper and this presentation are part of a broader reflection that I think needs very much to, 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 be, to be discussed today. Um, and also in the paper, the author makes very useful recommendations uh, as to how the sanctions practice could improve. So centralization of EU sanctions implementation, uh, prior impact assessment, realistic objectives, communication, and preserving the EU leverage. So building upon that, and also on what I've read in the paper, if I could ask uh, Julia a few, uh, a few questions before uh, passing the floor to, to Clara. Um, Perhaps, uh, so you need indeed, you mentioned indeed this need for clarity and achievability, sorry, of sanctions objective that, you know, we cannot set the bar too high and ex expect uh, unachievable objectives. So, for example, if, if you could redesign the objectives in the sanctions regime, what would that be for Belarus, but also especially for Russia, but also for uh, other of the many sanctions regime that we have uh, currently into place? Um, you also mentioned in the paper, very interestingly, the, the signaling effects of sanctions, right? Putting the spot on the people uh, that you want to sanction, but you, you, you said also that sometimes that signaling effect of sanctions fails because some of the persons that are targeted are not even aware that they are, they're, they've been added on the sanctions list. So if they're not aware of that, it means that the sanctions are, are not having a practical impact on their daily life, on their financial transactions, on their ability to travel. So. What conclusions should we draw from that uh, for the EU sanctions practice? Is, isn't it a sign that the effectiveness is very sometimes limited uh, for some uh, list of people? Um, I was also very much interested in, in your point on the, the, the need for a complete centralization, especially regarding sexual sanctions. Uh, and I mean, we've seen the stalemates that a lack of centralization can imply, especially when we've been discussing the, the ban on oil imports from Russia, right? The EU announced that they would take a six package of sanctions. It took more than a month and a half to, to manage and negotiate that. And we have opt out for some member states. Hungary used that leverage to delist a patriar patriarchal. So we see that, that, you know, that this is bringing up uh, more fundamental issues. So, but in, in your view, how could such centralization be achieved with respect to central sanctions? How feasible is that uh, also? Uh, and then to conclude, to, to stop talking uh, about on my side, uh, I was wondering, Yulia, how then do you see on the longer term the evolution of EU sanctions against Belarus, but also uh, against Russia, for instance, uh, especially in terms of leverage? Um, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Celia. Um, Clara, I hope you'll understand if we pay, play this back to Julia for a moment for some, some swift responses. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this puts you on, on hold for a moment, but we will come to you, I promise. Julia, 
swift um, responses on those questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for all those questions, which are extremely difficult, I must say, because um, your first question was um, about the objectives uh, of EU sanctions and what exactly the European Union could do, how it could articulate them better. I do believe that those objectives, they might be um, clearly articulated also in the form of conditions of what the Belarusian regime has to do in order, for instance, for sanctions to be lifted. But I also, I stay realistic. So on the one hand, I understand that for Belarusian regime to comply with uh, EU sanctions objective, it means to commit political suicide because uh, it means to most probably held accountable those who constitute the core of the regime itself, like those all those law enforcement um, agencies that ensure that uh, Alexander Lukashenko stays in power. That's one thing. Another thing is, in my opinion, now for the European Union, it might be quite difficult to deal with Belarus uh, because um, I do question uh, to what extent the regime of Alexander Lukashenko is uh, autonomous and uh, independent. Because in my opinion, now when we have the situation of Russian troops being in Belarus, in my opinion, there is quite a lot of control from Kremlin. So with whom does the EU bargain in case of Belarus? With Belarus, with the regime of Alexander Lukashenko, or with Kremlin itself. And in case of the EU bargains with Kremlin, I think that it's much more difficult to exercise EU's leverage because, because Russia as such usually rejects this normative power of the European Union and also a moral authority of the European Union to impose sanctions. We see that uh, the Russian Federation and also Belar Belarusian regime, they respond with counter sanctions leading to this uh, loophole or to, to, to this like loop of punitive measures like responding to, to each other. Uh, then when it comes to the signaling potential of sanctions, I was quoting the paper by, uh, by Professor Portella, and that, that was the case of uh, Zimbabwe. And I think that uh, in making comparison between Belarus and Zimbabwe might be, um, uh, I cannot really use data for Zimbabwe in case of Belarus because Belarus shares common border with three EU member states. And uh, in my opinion, uh, those sanctions are more impactful for the Belarusian elites who might be used to travel quite uh, often to EU member states, at least to, to Poland or to, to Lithuania. And then there is a great question about centralization. Uh, we know that there are debates now uh, with respect to qualified majority voting on sanctions, but this might also present uh, pitfalls uh, because uh, already now we question uh, the implementation, a harmonious implementation of sanctions by member states are being uh, voted against the will of one member state. Wouldn't this undermine then um, the efficiency of the EU sanctions policy? So this might have some, uh, they might, this might backfire. So that's, this needs to be tested, we don't, we don't know yet. But maybe it was trying, and that's what being asked for by the European Parliament in the latest uh, suggestions for the review of EU treaties. Um, yeah, and thanks a lot, Julia. Thanks a lot, Julia. We'll certainly come back to some of these questions. I certainly have some, some of those aspects that I want to drill into a little deeper. But first, we have Clara. Um, you've been watching sanctions for well, a very long time, and uh, not only, I think, uh, uh, when it comes to EU sanctions, but also beyond. Uh, what's your take on some of the findings that Julia uh, has presented uh, on the issue, perhaps also more broadly, and perhaps also in relation to one of the most pressing points? I mean, what about those sanctions that we're trying to design or have rolled out against Russia over its war in Ukraine? Clara. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. So uh, I have to start by saying that I enjoyed uh, reading this paper. I particularly liked that it was quite comprehensive and detailed and that uh, uh, in a period of time where uh, everybody's eyes are set on the sanctions operation uh, against Russia, uh, it is refreshing to, uh, well, to, to find such a, a well-researched overview of the sanctions on Belarus, where actually a, a lot has been going on over the past few months. And I mean, I particularly valued the, or I particularly appreciate the, the fact that it has uh, highlighted how the purpose of the sanctions regime 
has been changing because we are all familiar with the sanctions that uh, the EU has had in uh, has had uh, on Belarus for for a number of years. Well, those that were um, um, considerably downsized in 2016, but uh, I mean, with the uh, the Ryanair uh, forced landing and uh, with the uh, ep the episodes. Uh, of um, well, basically facilitating the the, the transport of migrants uh, in, towards the, the Polish border, and later uh, obviously participating also in the in the uh, operation uh, against Ukraine. Well, the the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, all this has uh, in fundamentally uh, modified the the nature of the sanctions regime and it has a very nicely brought to the fore and i think that this is also well reflected in the paper how when the eu imposes sanctions in order to promote democratization it focuses on visa bans and asset freezes on a number of individuals complemented uh, with a, an arms embargo at some point but when the, um, the crisis that the EU wants to address or the issue that the EU wants to address is directly linked to its security, then it is ready to move to much more forceful measures, particularly sectorial embargoes, um, uh, trade, uh, and basically uh, even flight bans. And I mean, stuff that is simply much more serious. So this, this tells us something about the character of the EU as an international actor. I mean, it is an advocate of democracy, and it, it is very serious about promoting democracy in its neighborhood. But when its security is, is affected, then it is ready to go one step further, and actually quite, well, quite significantly further than in order to promote a, a, well, a democratic transition. Now, what I particularly liked about the paper is that in being comprehensive and touching upon very different aspects, it highlights a number of issues that are rather removed from the public eye, issues that are not discussed often in the framework of, of, of sanctions issues. One of them is the fact that uh, Belarus has happened to be one of the few testing grounds in the past that the EU had for trying to uh, lift sanctions or to relax them. Uh, and these, even in cases where there were no visible um, advances or there was no visible progress by the target to meet the, uh, the objectives of the EU. Actually, rather than relaxing the sanctions in order to reward uh, steps towards compliance, the relaxation was actually meant to promote steps towards compliance. So this didn't actually work. So we, we know that this was not a successful case, uh, but uh, in any case, it is, it is quite interesting to highlight that. So perhaps this is something that could be illuminated a bit better. So what were the rationales? Why was the EU interested in experimenting and even promoting the, the a relaxation of the of the sanctions or the ultimate lifting of the sanctions, despite the fact that there were no signs of tangible progress. And uh, something that I also felt was quite interesting to highlight was the the uh, blacklisting of journalists, because I mean, if we compare uh, in, in the current sanctions regime with the sanctions imposed by the United Nations, which are uh, often the blueprint. Or the, or the inspiration for uh, EU sanctions policies, uh, pri well, previous investigations uh, have shown that in most cases, those individual blacklists, uh, blacklisted are, uh, are mostly decision makers or deputies to the decision makers, so basically um, uh, leadership of the countries. Uh, they, they are often also administrators or senior uh, well, uh, senior bureaucrats in, in the countries involved. And uh, often they are also facilitators or let's say uh, individuals who are active in the business community, legal or illegal, that actually help the, the, continu the continuation of the policies that the sanctions are trying to address. But uh, if we look at uh, the identity of, indivi of individuals that the EU is a blacklisting nowadays. I mean, there's a lot of talk about the oligarchs, of course, but we actually also have judges designated, and we also have journalists designated. 
and uh, this goes beyond this is actually separate from blacklist, blacklisting media outlets in the context of this information. So um, what is the individual responsibility of specific journalists and how uh, important or how, how adequate uh, is it to blacklist individual journalists for, for the reporting? I mean, um, this is a debate that we haven't actually had uh, as far as uh, designations are concerned. There's uh, so much uh, focus on oligarchs and there's so much focus on the top leadership. But um, what about uh, these individuals? Are we right to actually blacklist judges and uh, journalists? And uh, does, does it help? Or are we simply, uh, I mean, are we just taking, are we getting carried away? Are we getting carried away in just blacklisting everybody whom we consider to be contrary to the, to the um, objectives of, uh, of the sanctions regimes? So um, finally, I, I also, I mean, I also um, like the fact that uh, the paper uh, looks uh, at, well, I mean, basically it looks at the extent to which the sanctions have fulfilled their objectives, which is obviously the, the topic that everybody is interested in. But um, I mean, I think that it does a good job in identifying that on the one hand, uh, the promotion of democratization or a transition towards democracy, which is what the original uh, EU sanctions regime uh, against Belarus was meant to do, uh, didn't uh, succeed, not even uh, in prior to the lifting in 2016. Uh, what I was wondering is, okay, if we admit that uh, this sanctions regime was not in, was not uh, effective in promoting uh, democratization or any tangi tangible progress towards democratization. Was this sanctions regime good for anything? Was it good at doing anything? Did it promote any uh, positive steps? So perhaps if we consider the fact that in, in several instances, the uh, easing of the sanctions was linked to the release of uh, political prisoners, Perhaps we can still, um, well, we can still determine that uh, even though no uh, progress towards democratization was achieved, at least the sanctions managed to keep these uh, members of the of the political opposition alive, or keep them free, or um, uh, prevent a situation in which they might have been tortured. And I mean, what are the implications for democratization in the long term? I mean, if we uh, manage to keep these individuals active uh, and uh, alive uh, in, in, in Belarus, this is something that might lead in future to the existence of uh, some, well, basically some political opposition that can develop into new political parties and eventually at some point in future, uh, provide a, a, well, let's say an intellectual, um, uh, well, an, uh, an intellectual um, um, group of human resources, so to say, that can be uh, uh, can be members of a democratic Belarus in future. Or, I mean, let me just uh, simplify the the whole question: um, Were these sanctions effective in doing anything at all? And if so, what did they actually manage to do? What were the posi these positive effects, if any? And uh, well, uh, finally, um, I was also wondering uh, whether you could position yourself in this uh, as in this tension that uh, the paper depicts. So on the one hand, there is a, well, there is this complaint that well, the sanctions did not bring about a, a democratization. Um, we also have the well, we also have a, a criticism. Uh, on the other hand, that the relaxation of sanctions in the absence of progress is something that would send the wrong signal to, well, basically to those advocating democratization and, uh, and uh, opposition uh, forces or civil society in Belarus. So this is not, so to say, this is not uh, the advice that you would like to give to, to the sanctions senders. And at the same time, there is also this, this complaint that uh, oh, the goals are not realistic because 
if you want to promote democratization, if you want the, the leadership to call free and fair elections, then you are basically asking the Lukashenko regime to, uh, to commit political suicide. So I wonder, I wonder where you would position yourself in this entire tension, which is obviously the, which is obviously the, the main uh, question with uh, all these long-term sanctions regimes. Um, if you want to keep faithful to your uh, original objectives, then you have to leave it in place, to keep it in place. If you relax it, then you are sending the wrong signal to the, uh, to the uh, pro-democracy forces in the country. Uh, but at the same time, um, the goal is not realistic. So what's the point of keeping this sanctions regime if it, if it doesn't have a perspective? Of fulfilling its original objective, so there I was. I was wondering if you could, well, if you could um, uh, take a position as to as to how to resolve this tension. Okay, so these are basically my comments, and thank, thanks a lot for for the paper, and thanks also for inviting me to this event. Uh, back to you, uh, Jörg. Thanks a lot. Uh, excellent points. I mean, the last question in particular, I think we should sort of play back to Yulia uh, right away. Um, any immediate response from you on that, on that question? It's a hard one, I admit that. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Patella, for uh, commenting on my paper, and I'm very pleased to hear your feedback. And when it comes to your question, um, I think, first of all, in the past, the Belarusian regime at least was trying to preserve its place and was trying to engage with the European Union. Um, notably under this framework um, of, um, um, of critical engagement. Uh, but now, after what happened after 2020, in my opinion, the, the Belarusian regime knows that they completely lost their face with respect to the European Union, especially after uh, those cases of torture, uh, after um, this case of instrumentalization of migrants, so in my opinion, now we have the regime, which is to some extent using warfare against the European Union. And um, the question is uh, how to proceed, um, taking into account that I say that those objectives of EU sanctions policy, that they are not uh, realistic. I would say that the European Union shall start, in my opinion, play um, in a more in a smarter way with the Belarusian regime. So try to extract as many concessions as the European Union can. Uh, for instance, the release of political prisoners, the rehabilitation of political prisoners, also potentially um, create conditions under which those who are in exile, that they can return back to Belarus and don't face, uh, and not to face any uh, criminal prosecution. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think it will be very difficult to make everyone happy because in case if the European Union starts negotiating with the Belarusian regime, I'm sure that a lot of uh, members of the Belarusian opposition will be against that because for them, the only condition under which the EU shall negotiate with, uh, with the Belarusian regime is when uh, Alexander Lukashenko leaves his, uh, uh, his office. And I must admit that uh, indeed the, the situation is uh, is very complex. On the one hand, objectives are not realistic, uh, but on the other hand, what they you can do, that's, that's another question. I, 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 wish I, I wish I knew. Thank you, Yulia. I think the question to some extent is also to which uh, Alexander Lukashenko is still an, a sort of independent political actor, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the leeway that's, uh, uh, that he's had in the past, also in relations with the EU, uh, has shrunk to an extent where you can question whether he's actually able uh, uh, at this current stage to uh, uh, to conduct any meaningful uh, interaction with the EU, perhaps also negotiations on anything like political prisoner sanctions and, uh, and so on. Uh, but what I would like to throw in is two questions that's, uh, that have come in uh, uh, on sort of Belarus uh, specifically, uh, uh, Directly to to Julia, but obviously Celia, Clara, you should uh, you should chime in here. Uh, the one is uh, uh, from Alexei Znatyevich. Hi, Alex. Um, what should be the main difference in the level and types of sanctions against Belarus and Russia in the current situation of war? 
the background here is obviously that in many ways, uh, in response to the Russian war against Ukraine and the facilitation of that war by Belarus, uh, um, uh, EU and broader Western uh, punitive action has basically lumped together uh, Belarus and, and Russia in, uh, in many ways. Um, so the question here is uh, whether there should be a differentiation between these uh, between these two actors. And related to that is a, uh, another question to, uh, from, from Taras um, uh, that basically asks, is there anything that the EU could still add uh, to, uh, to its sanctions to have more of an impact in Belarus? Because the sanctions as they are in place now, they're quite sweeping already. They address address many of the uh, sort of more sensitive points also in the Belarusian economy. So, what is there that uh, that could actually be added uh, in relation to Belarus? Uh, we'll give that question to Julia first, but I'm sure that Clara and Celia also have thoughts on on those questions. Julia, uh, of course, the Belarusian regime uh, is a co-aggressor together with the Russian Federation, and uh, I would say that the Belarusian authorities they also they deserve to be sanctioned. And in a similar way as, um, as, as the Russian Federation. Uh, but I would insist that in a strategic communication, the European Union still must make a differentiation between Belarus and Russia, because otherwise, in my opinion, the European Union will be following the same approach as, uh, as, uh, as Kremlin does when claims that Belarusians, Ukrainians, and Russians are just the same people. Uh, and I also believe that uh, the Belarusian society is different from the Russian society, uh, especially in terms of um, being brainwashed, because we know that there are quite a lot of people in Russia who support this ag aggression, and that's not the case of Belarus. A lot of Belarusians, they protest against, uh, they, they try to protest, of course it's not possible under the current circumstances, uh, but they do not support the use of the Belarusian territory uh, by, by the Russian Federation. And it's important, we know that or just when after the Russian ag uh, aggression against Ukraine started, uh, the European Union uh, was, um, some member states of the European Union were adopting measures, uh, like for instance, visa restrictions, um, residence permit restrictions uh, against uh, both uh, Belarusian and Russian citizens. Uh, several educational institutions uh, also canceled educational programs for Belarusian nationals. And from this point of view, uh, personally, I find this um, as, a, as a mistake, uh, because in my opinion, in 2020, uh, Belarusians clearly showed that they uh, choose uh, democratic uh, Pass uh, uh, of Belarus and also European pass of Belarus, and uh, the way how the EU approach towards Belarus and the Belarusian society changed in just in the in the last months, it's it's completely ra radical because in the beginning the European Union was really like on the side of the people of Belarus and was making a difference between Belarusians and our authorities. Uh, but now sometimes in the communication you might have this impression that there is no differentiation anymore between the Belarusian authorities and the Belarusian. Uh, Belarusian society. So I would insist uh, on, on this point that they, they must be uh, a differentiation uh, and also in the way how um, the European Union um, presents its uh, sanctions uh, with respect both to, to Russia and Belarus and the media, because still I, I have an impression that both countries are being all the time put in the same basket as if uh, Belarus was, uh, was not uh, a sovereign state uh, um, anymore. Then there is a great but very difficult question on what the European Union can still do with respect to its uh, sanctions or what it can add. Um, I would say that um, I think the biggest impact on the Belarusian regime was done not actually by the European sanctions, but by Lithuania, who stopped transporting the Belarusian potash products and it completely collapsed all the logistics uh, uh, and now the Belarusian authorities, they cannot reroute uh, uh, their exports anymore of all those uh, potash uh, and uh, oil products, also steel products, even if there is demand uh, on, uh, uh, from other countries, particularly uh, from some Asian countries, but it's impossible to, to transport those, uh, those, those products. 
So I would say that uh, what the EU can further do uh, to, if it wants to further impact the, the, the Belarusian regime is to make sure that they do not gain access to, uh, to European ports. And that's something which was potentially discussed uh, by the European leaders and that what Lukashenko discussed also uh, with the UN uh, uh, representative. Thank you, Yulia. Uh, Celia, Clara, thoughts uh, from your end on these questions? You can, you can go first, uh, Clara, if you wish. Well, uh, I mean, all I can say is that I suspect that uh, the level of antagonism that has been elicited by the uh, recent uh, developments with Belarus, they have, well, this is unprecedented. It has nothing to do with the, with the previous um, negative relationship that the EU had with Belarus. It was actually, um, it, it still offered some potential for Belarus to play a little bit with uh, Russia and uh, in the EU. So when relations uh, improved with one, they could worsen with the other, or when they worsen with one, um, it could work on improving relations with the other in order to show that it had more options. But uh, I mean, the, the, the phase we are in now is quite different. And I suspect that this also has to do with uh, Russia um, well, uh, trying to uh, encourage uh, Belarus to be more combative and uh, more aggressive vis-a-vis -vis the EU. Because after all, uh, Belarus have been under sanctions by the EU for a very long time, well, uh, pretty, well uh, almost for a decade, and it had never uh, reacted too negatively to that in the sense that it, ne it never took uh, any action in order to to, uh, to respond to the, the, the blacklisting of officials or the asset freezes or even the suspension of trade preferences or the arms embargo. So uh, the fact that, the, uh, that uh, Belarus is reacting now is responding to these sanctions with very hostile actions uh, tends to, well, I mean, gives the impression that uh, some Russian encouragement has been behind it, precisely in order to create this united front or this the, the same level of uh, hostility between Belarus and the EU as, uh, as between uh, Russia and the EU. So uh, from that point of view, I mean, the EU is, is rather, well, is lacking options uh, to um, well, to basically to negotiate with uh, with Belarus uh, in order to reduce the, the level of of, of hostility, uh, but at the same time, uh, of course, there is still more potential uh, with Belarus, particularly in uh, in the coming months, as the well the the, the effects of the uh, migrant crisis and the, the forced landing of uh, of Ryanair. Um, of the Ryanair flight dissipates. So when yeah. things start calming down, there, there's definitely going to be more potential to, to well, basically to negotiate against with, with uh, again, uh, with Belarus. But the thing is that it is not, it is not a coincidence. I mean, there seems to be a clearly an, an encouragement uh, um, coming from Russia to not just uh, accept the, the sanctions and try to negotiate uh, with the EU in order to get the sanctions lifted, but to actually respond with, um, with more hostile measures, which obviously lead to an escalation and to a deterioration of, um, of relations that is, is quite difficult to, to repair. Thanks, Clara. Celia? Uh, yeah, of course, I fully agree with everything that's been said. If I take perhaps a more uh, uh, detailed perspective on something else, uh, building on what Yula said, I agree that there's even more now that we're assimilating the sanctions with, against Belarus with the ones against Russia, only if you look at the timeline. When Now, when we adopt new packages of sanctions, very often against Russia, we take similar sanctions against Belarus. And I mean, we already had into place some sexual sanctions against Belarus in reaction to uh, the deterioration of the situation, the, human, uh, the migrant crisis. But now we've, you know, every time we take uh, new sanctions against Russia, sectors wise, uh, disconnecting banks from SWIFT, we usually resort to the same uh, with regard to Belarus. 
Uh, and this assimilation for me also took the, the um, another form, which is if you pay attention, so we had this pre-existent, of course, sanctions frameworks against Belarus. When we wanted to sanction Belarus for its involvement in the conflict, we could have adopted a different sanctions regime, right? What we did instead was modify the, the, the title of the current sanctions regime, which was in view of the internal situation in Belarus, and we added and its involvement in the conflict. So as you listen, we're now trying to, you know, we're sort of diffusing and putting everything in the same, the same framework, diffusing, interconnecting the two of them, even though indeed, as Julia mentioned, there is internal situation on the one hand, and there's, of course, the involvement in the conflict, which, of course, they're intricated, but they're, they should be treated differently. Uh, as for the level of, of, of sanctions, what, I, what I've noticed um, by studying the, san the sanctions, the, the decisions, the listings of individuals and entities is, I, one can argue that the level is still not the same. I mean, if you look at the individual listings under the Russian sanctions regime, I mean, we're now we're now reaching the point where we're listing the daughter of of, of Pesh, Peskov because she is living a luxurious uh, way of life and she's part of contributing to the uh, compromising the territorial integrity of Ukraine. We have been listing uh, the woman, uh, the wife of an oligarch, because she owns a house in Crimea. So we're we're re reaching now levels where the council is proceeding to listings that are arguably less and less uh, linked to the conflict. Or we've been listing, I think, owners of companies who print t-shirts with a Z symbol uh, to support Russia. So clearly, we're not at that stage. Individual listings of Belarus, maybe the EU will resort to that. I do not know. But it's true that I think the EU should keep uh, that differentiation, at least for that, not to fall into the trap that it might be doing with Russia of additioning, adding, 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 adding people on the sanctions list without necessarily the sufficient rationale and motivation and evidence to keep some leverage. Um, sorry, so it's a bit a bit deviating from what we've been saying, but this is what I wanted to add. Uh, thanks. Um, there are a couple of additional questions that I will sort of um, uh, let wait for uh, for a few minutes. There are uh, sort of two very good questions. One of the on the avoidance of sanctions. The other one on sort of uh, uh, sanctions and other tools in EU foreign policy. But I would like to stick with uh, uh, with sanctions uh, uh, for the moment because there were a couple of things that that you all mentioned uh, that I think uh, is worth drilling down a little deeper. Um, one uh, is the question, I mean, you, you called it centralization. I mean, there's obviously a political process where agreement needs to be found amongst political actors. But I think there's an element uh, where the centralization sort of is, is, uh, is more imaginable. Uh, and that is in pulling together information that will eventually substantiate sanctions. I mean, this is obviously also something where a lot of information analysis and, and facts are needed as a basis before you design uh, sanctions. And this is where I have the impression that the European Union has a distinct weakness uh, because uh, it doesn't have an elaborate sort of institutional structure to collect the necessary intelligence that you can then basically use to design sanctions. This is very different in the United States, where the Treasury Department has uh, sort of a very extensive uh, intelligence apparatus, basically, uh, to uh, uh, to inform sanctions. So uh, this is where my question uh, uh, to you all would be. I mean, what is there on the institutional side in the European Union that would be needed in order to build sanctions regime in a uh, in a way that is perhaps even better informed that is sort of more better factually or evidence based than uh, than it is so far because it seems to me there is a uh, there is a distinct weakness and you mentioned also even uh, even some of the examples so this is one question i think that uh, that i'd like to sort of pose to you the other one uh, goes i think especially also to celia because you mentioned it and that has something to do with, uh, with the notion of proportionality. Um, uh, you mentioned this early on. Um, how do you imagine sanctions to be sort of proportionate to actions by a, a country or a government? I mean, I think this is a, uh, this is a justice question that is as old as mankind. Um, I mean, what, which crime deserves which punishment, right? So, uh, can you elaborate on this a little bit? How do you imagine this notion of sort of proportionality in, uh, in all of this? And the last one is uh, a question also from my end, sort of sanctions 
um, even if they, and this is what Clara uh, uh, related to earlier on, even if sanctions have very limited effect on the targeted country, uh, they also have an effect on us. I mean, sanctions are also a form of um, sort of a political self-confirmation uh, of positions that we take, of political unity, of values that we want to highlight. So uh, aren't we sort of uh, making a mistake if we only sort of look at the effect of sanctions on the side that's being sanctioned? And aren't we looking sufficiently uh, at the effect that also is supposed to have on, on our own political positioning, uh, coalition building, uh, and so on? So this also is a question to all of you, because I think this is an, an aspect that's not, not unimportant. Um, Julia, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, Jörg. And I think this is a, a very interesting question with respect to intelligence. Uh, that's something I was uh, also studying before when I was doing my research on EU sanctions in response to cyber attacks because I was also questioning uh, what body within the European Union will be involved in collecting those forensics, whether it's going to be done by member states separately or whether there will be some uh, centralization within the European Union. And for instance, if I uh, shift a little bit to the question of uh, uh, sanctions in response to cyber attacks, uh, we can see that there is a lot there is a lot going on within the uh, special uh, working parties on cyber issues within insen uh, um, which uh, which is in uh, involved in in, in collecting uh, uh, for forensics and doing analysis for the european external action service uh, i was conducting some interviews and i wanted to know whether insen is involved in uh, in one way or in another in the EU sanctions on Belarus, but from my discussions with the EU officials, I had an impression that it in San is not involved, at least with respect to uh, collecting evidence, because most of our, uh, those whom I interviewed, they um, uh, highlighted that EU sanctions, they rely on open source data. And this is uh, an established practice now in the European Union, because in the past, there were um, cases when uh, sanctions were challenged in front of the Court of Justice and then the Council was not ready to disclose evidence because it was coming from a confidential source and those then those sanctions were just struck down by the Court of Justice because the Court said that no evidence then it means no sanctions and here I'm, I'm speaking mostly about um, Iranian sanctions um, but um, uh, I still believe that indeed um, the European Union needs to have uh, better uh, analytical capacities to make sure that uh, it comes up with the most relevant um, and the most recent sanctions listing and that it's well aware of uh, whom within the Belarusian political system must be targeted. Because the pro problem might be that those who are targeted, uh, the question is to what extent they can influence upon uh, Alexander Lukashenko or upon the Belarusian allies. So how the how the EU can make sure that it targets exactly those who influence the decision making within uh, within Belarus. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Clara, over to you this time on those issues. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, I think that as far as as far as capacities are concerned, I mean, of course, it is a cost effective way to increase capacities at Brussels level. So basically to expand the, the capacities of the external election service and to some extent also of FISMA because when sanctions are sectorial, they fall within the realm of, of the commission. But uh, I wouldn't advise the member states to forget uh, about their own capacities. So uh, it is important also to have capacities uh, at the member state level. Uh, particularly, uh, well, particularly because uh, I mean, the, uh, they also fit in national capacities. Also fit in into what the the EU does, and uh, it is very difficult to uh, think of the institutions as um, being able to expand capacities to such an extent that they would really make up for the lack of capacities at member state level. So, I mean, I would actually like to see an expansion of capacity also at the level of member state, at the level of foreign ministries, 
and I mean, having basically having more sources of information is something that will um, will um, enhance the, the the capacity of the of the EU rather than relying on a single uh, source of information, even if uh, if uh, court requirements are that uh, everything should be open sourced ultimately. As far as the well, um, as far as uh, the third, well, your third question uh, is concerned. Um, how do sanctions affect our own um, uh, political positioning, or how uh, how do they um, help us uh, build uh, our identity as a foreign policy actor uh, when we look at the EU? I think that uh, it is this is definitely one of the most important functions that sanctions have: positioning the European Union geopolitically and uh, strategically and internationally as an advocate of human rights and democracy. And uh, I mean, I think that this, this function is something that these sanctions are already fulfilling, irrespective of whether they manage to promote a, a change in the, in the leadership uh, or in the countries on which they are imposed. But at the same time, it is, uh, I mean, this shouldn't detract, the, the fact that this uh, function is being fulfilled shouldn't detract from the, the focus on the, uh, on the target country. So um, uh, perhaps rather than uh, relying so much on sanctions, we should also uh, consider um, not just the question of, of whether to impose sanctions or otherwise, but what, what is the specific mix of sanctions that we need in which cases it is useful to impose sanctions, when it is useful not to impose sanctions, and especially how to go about it. So do we, do we need to blacklist journalists? Do we need to blacklist judges? Do we need to go for the top uh, leadership? Uh, is it better to, stop, to, to start with the uh, mid-level administrators? So, um, I mean, a bit more reflection should be given as to uh, how exactly we go about the imposition of sanctions and how they how they interact with other tools in EU foreign policy. Actually, uh, uh, some 20 years ago, a lot of focus existed on conditionality as a tool in the foreign policy of the EU. And um, I mean, actually, it was often regarded uh, as a successful instrument. And I mean, we seem to have almost forgotten about conditionality as a, as a foreign policy instrument in order to give way to sanctions. So, I mean, I, I think that, for example, something that was, that, uh, was quite useful is what, uh, what Celia just mentioned about the fact that uh, in the case of, uh, of Belarus, uh, instead of creating separate sanctions regimes, uh, there is just one sanctions regime that is clustering all the, the, well, basically all the complaints that the EU or all the, the, uh, the difficulties that, that the EU has with Belarus at the moment. While in the case of Russia, a, a lot of care was taken to separate different sanctions regimes, uh, one for Crimea, another one for a misappropriation of state assets, another one for destabilization of Ukraine. And actually when it comes to um, downsizing or easing or even lifting the measures, it's very useful to have these separate sanctions regimes. Even with Iran, we had a, a sanctions regime for proliferation, and then we had a separate sanctions regime for human rights. So um, if uh, any target ever uh, decides to be responsive and to start implementing, uh, implementing uh, reforms, it's going to be much easier to reciprocate if we have separate sanctions regimes that can be lifted separately, then um, to have, well, to, to lift or to ease a sanctions regime that looks like a Christmas tree, which is basically what the, what the uh, UN uh, normally does and what the Belarus sanctions regime is starting to, to look like. Because I mean, at the end, there are just so many designation criteria that it is, it makes, this makes it difficult for the, or so many rationales to the, to the, um, a sanctions regime that it makes it difficult for the concerned leadership to believe that the sanctions regime is ever going to be lifted. Because I mean, once a problem is solved, there will still be like three or four other, other topics that need to be resolved. So, I mean, to me, um, this increasing capacity is not simply 
uh, necessary in order to make sure that implementation is, uh, is going the right way, that evasion is being detected and corrected. It is also important to, in, to increase capacities in order to give more thought uh, to sensors regimes to better design them. And a very little, very little uh, attention uh, has, been, has been devoted to, uh, to the design of sensors regimes. I think that we are also seeing a lot of reflexes or a, let's say transfer from one sensors regime to the other, so that basically the same measure spreads to many sensors regimes without, without a prior consideration as to what is actually going to work better for each of the, of the situations that are being addressed. Thank you, Clara. Uh, Celia, especially on the question of proportionality, I'm curious. Yes, I, I will tackle it. Uh, just, just one point, uh, indeed, to, to confirm what Clara said, uh, we actually have at least five sanctions regime targeting specifically Russia, uh, also with the one targeting the Donbass. So indeed, it shows this, this more tailoring aspect. We could also raise the question of the use of the human rights sanctions regime, which is perhaps underused. We're listing people on the Russian sanctions list, for, for example, for the atrocities committed in Bucha, perhaps that could be. So this is also a reflection that might also be put as through the interaction with human rights sanctions regime, which I think in my view pre presented the ultimate advantage, immediate advantage of disconnecting the, gr the grievance against the country to put them in a more objective way, that is to say human rights uh, violations. But uh, moving to the proportionality, uh, it's a very difficult question, as, as you can imagine. It's, it's even more difficult to, to define what is a proportionate reaction to a specific behavior that we see divergent approaches uh, across the globe. For example, I mean, the EU has adopted different levels of sanctions for similar behaviors or has reacted sometimes not uh, in an excessive way or uh, for example, if we take the example of, of Crimea in 2014, you have many experts now that say, well, compared to what we're doing now with Russia, the sanctions we imposed in reaction to the annexation of Crimea was absolutely nothing. So, of course, it's always subjective and always debatable. You can also take the example of what the US does. Uh, the US or Canada or the UK might have different approaches to the same behavior as the EU does. We have sometimes conflicting approaches. If you take the example of uh, sanctions against Iran, the EU repeatedly criticizes the, the US sanctions against Iran, their secondary effect. We cannot even turn to the to the UN uh, as an example, because as we know, some, some of the sanctions are blocked by you know, the veto power within uh, the UN Security Council. So I think the answer doesn't lie too much in what should be our response to the, to the behavior, but how we word that response. And that is where we should be looking at the listing criteria. And up until now, there has been no judicial review of the wording of the listing criteria. The court is clearly refraining from it. But depending on how you frame the listing criteria, you close the door or you open it to listing more and more people. And the broader, the vaguer listing criteria are, this is where we fall into the danger of having disproportionate measures. Uh, if we clearly gave definition of what active support to a government is, of what destabilization is, of uh, what, what does uh, compromising the internal, inter sorry, territorial integrity, sovereignty and independence of a nation recovers, then you would be able to more clearly see what is proportionate, what isn't. And that also would perhaps discourage the council from listing virtually anyone because it, it can now, given how, given what we've been witnessing so far. So more control of the wording of the listing criteria, more precise definition of the concept and more, uh, stricter control of the motivation and evidence that is provided in support to the listing criteria. Excellent. Uh, if, if I may, Thank I would you. like I would, yeah, if I may, I just would like to follow up a little bit on this question of proportionality, because I think this is also relevant with respect to journalists, because indeed in the past we had cases when um, the Court of Justice had to strike a balance between, on the one hand, uh, freedom of expression and uh, freedom of information, right to information, and on the other hand, whether we can allow those propagandist uh, um, uh, activities. Uh, and I refer specifically of the case, uh, to the case of Kiselov or to the case of Mihalchenko, who was a Belarusian journalist. He was targeted by the council. And then those sanctions were struck down by the Court of Justice, who said that there is not enough proof that he was directly involved in, um, in, in repressions and post-electoral violence. But the outcome, for instance, with respect to Kisilov, who is a Russian propagandist, uh, was completely different. In, in that case, the, the Court of Justice uh, upheld the, the EU sanctions and considered his activities as, a, as, as a propaganda activities. And I do believe that uh, most probably the case of journalists is the most interesting with respect to proportionality because we have uh, two uh, um, 
colliding interests are on, on the one hand EU foreign policy, but on the other hand, freedom of uh, information and how to strike this uh, right, right balance. Uh, and I think this discussion is even more relevant when we take into account this current situation of information wars, because in Belarus and Russia, everyone is speaking about information wars, about psi or operations. So that's something, in my opinion, which is fascinating and which you know, needs to, to be explored further with respect to, to sanctions. Thank you, Julia. Very important addition. Um, I'm mindful of time. So uh, I will pose the sort of last three questions that I see, especially also in the, in the chat function, uh, uh, to one of you uh, individually. Um, the first is a question from uh, Susan Stewart at the uh, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik here in Berlin. Uh, that is uh, basically points to the fact that uh, sanctions are obviously only one element or instrument uh, in a broader foreign policy uh, toolbox. Um, we're zooming in on sanctions very much, uh, but um, there are other instruments uh, out there. So I want to sort of play this to Clara directly. Um, uh, what are the sort of complementary or alternative instruments that are in the EU's foreign toolbox either now or potentially ideally at some stage in the future um, uh, that can sort of work either in tandem with sanctions or that uh, that should also be considered in addition and so uh, here's a question about uh, um, a focus on sanctions being quite narrow if we think of a broader foreign policy toolbox that the EU should uh, should have. Then, uh, uh, and I'll pose these uh, these questions to you and uh, to you individually, and then we come, I come to you for the uh, for the answers. Uh, then there is a question that I want to uh, to pose to Celia about the avoidance of sanctions. Uh, there's a question from Evaldas. Uh, about how Russia in particular, perhaps uh, given its uh, sort of pervasive corruption in the country, is able to avoid uh, sanctions. I would broaden this a little bit and say, what are the mechanisms that we, that we know, that we are aware of when individual country that is being sanctioned manages to get around some of the impact of those uh, sanctions, either on its own, um, as in this question uh, on Russia, or perhaps with the, uh, uh, with the help of uh, other countries. I mean, we have reports that Russia is trying to get around some of the sanctions with the help of Kazakhstan, with the help of Belarus. So um, uh, what, what do we see there in the, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the side of those sanctions in efforts and also in successes perhaps uh, in avoiding uh, sanctions? And the question that I would like to pass to, uh, to Julia, um, since you also mentioned it uh, uh, in your paper, in the discussion here, in uh, earlier conversations that we had is, um, how can we sort of manage and limit the fallout uh, um, uh, of sanctions on ordinary citizens? There's a question also in the chat that asks exactly that question that's, um, uh, uh, since 24th of February, uh, uh, EU sanctions are basically uh, uh, directed at uh, EU uh, at Belarusian passport holders uh, uh, at large. That leaves a lot of Belarusians who had to flee their own country in a very difficult situation. So you, here you have an example of one of those effects where an EU sanction, even if well intended, directly has a, a, an almost existential impact on, uh, on ordinary citizens, in this case outside of the country, uh, but it obviously uh, uh, also pertains to, uh, or there are effects on people inside of the country. So how can we sort of design sanctions in a way uh, that perhaps avoid some of this fallout uh, um, on uh, ordinary citizens at large of, uh, of sanctions? Uh, let's start with Clara and your question, or my question to you. Thank you. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to be I'm going to be uh, rather uh, quick. Uh, I mean, basically, the EU has plenty of tools at its disposal, and there isn't uh, a need to resort to sanctions all the time. Actually, uh, I mean, I mentioned already the use of conditionality that was regarded as very promising a few years ago, uh, all of a sudden it seems to have completely disappeared 
and nobody is talking about the potential of conditionality in the context of the contractual relations that the EU has with third countries. But I mean, beyond resolving specific crises, uh, the, I mean, I think that the EU is well aware that the, the problems that are behind uh, much instability uh, uh, outside the, the EU, and particularly in the periphery uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the Union, uh, ha uh, this has to do with long-term problems that need to be resolved in peacetime. So, um, the, the, I mean, sanctions are no healing, um, uh, healing um, uh, medicine. Uh, they can help uh, resolve specific crises, but they don't have the potential of correcting um, long-term deficits. So, I mean, what is, what, uh, what is um, uh, particularly useful for the EU is to activate its uh, tools in peacetime in order to try to prevent the recurrence of, of uh, problems and particularly instability in its uh, neighborhood, which uh, is something that it has been suffering from um, over the past 10 years, much more than, than before. So that's, that's all I can say. Uh, back to you, Jörg. Thank you, Clara. Celia, on the avoidance of, question, uh, of sanctions, sorry. Uh, indeed, on avoidance, I mean, we, I think we can, all, we can all agree that there is a strong learning curve among the persons who are targeted and might be targeted by sanctions. I mean, first of all, banks, first of all, banks are ever more compliant. They are even more careful by, by, by the days, by the weeks, of course, because they're afraid to be themselves sanctioned. So banks are also potentially warning their clients or warning the companies that sanctions might be coming. And in the case of the EU, we had advertised the imposition of sanctions for a month should uh, Russia proceed with invasion. So, of course, the more you threaten to sanction, the more you push the target to, to, to put in place some mechanisms. So this is something that I think it's, it's difficult to avoid on our side. Um, but this is why this, the, the EU might say this is why we are enlarging circles of persons targeted. This is why we're targeting the families of oligarchs, of Putin, of Lavrov, just precisely to at least limit the flow of, of, of money, of assets within, within the country. Now, with, with the help, for example, of countries like Kazakhstan to help Russia evade the sanctions, I think, I mean, in my opinion, there's a limit to what can be achieved by sanctions anyway. I mean, there's limits to what be done, can be done through that instrument. I think there's an author that said, we cannot achieve with a pistol what should be achieved with a cannon. So I think it's also important to acknowledge the limits of, of, of sanctions and not to, to, to build this rationale that we can reach anyone with, with the restrictive measures. That being said, I think there, there are improvements that can be done even within the EU in the first place. I mean, given the, the number of the billion of euros of assets that have been uh, frozen within the EU, it shows that there's, there's potential to, to enforce and to, to fight avoidance. Um, I mean, I think, uh, first of all, the, the, the creation of you know, specific task forces within the commission, this Operation OSCAR, Operation with Europol to trace back the assets, I think is, is a good step in that direction. And especially we need uh, more teams of experts to, to more cooperate, as Clara pointed out, especially since we're now seeing that we're, I mean, the focus is very much put on recovering assets and on avoiding compliance more than ever, avoiding uh, avoidance, sorry. Uh, we see that now it's even more difficult than ever to trace back the ownership of a property through a trust fund that belongs to a friend of an oligarch. So we see that the mechanisms are becoming more complex and that the EU needs to answer uh, accordingly along with the member states who already deal with that issue of assets within the EU. And now a uh, last option also, uh, there could be of course some, some things to explore with you know, this, this sort of requirement for third states to align with the EU sanctions. And now we're talking about potential candidates for accession, members of the European neighborhood policy. Again, there can be, this can be argued to what extent can we, are we legitimate to ask them to align on the sanctions which they have not voted upon, but this might be also an intermediate measure to, to mitigate, of course, this inevitable avoidance uh, problem for sanctions. Thank you, Celia. Finally, Julia. Yeah, the question of the design of EU sanctions and what to do in order to uh, mitigate those negative consequences for the Belarusian citizens. I do believe that it's a very valid core question because at the moment we can witness this mini revolution in EU sanctions policy when sanctions move, shift again from targeted measures to broader measures. And that's uh, com completely the opposite was in mid 90s when everyone was shifting from broad economic measures to targeted measures. And as such sanctions, they are meant to be targeted in line with EU, uh, 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 with EU Council sanctions uh, guidelines. But uh, taking into account that uh, all the events were involved in so quickly, uh, in my opinion, 
uh, it's highly possible that the European Union might want at some point to come back and to rethink some of those sanctions measures and also reflect how they could potentially be mitigated in order to make sure that they do not backfire at Belarusian citizens, but also at EU citizens themselves. Like we don't know what will be consequences of uh, Russian oil ban. We don't know what will be exactly the consequences of a potash products uh, uh, ban for the European uh, agricultural sector. Um, in my paper, for instance, I mentioned uh, this problem with um, uh, Belavia flights and with uh, children, uh, Chernobyl children that cannot have this direct route uh, between Minsk and, for instance, some Italian Italian cities as, as this was uh, in the past. So I, I would say that um, it's um, highly possible that um, in the future the EU will have to be more uh, precise with respect to its impact assessment of sanctions measures and specifically what kind of negative consequences those might entail, not only for those countries and targeted and their populations, but also for EU citizens themselves. Thank you, Julia. Uh, clearly, I mean, also from these last responses that you that you gave, I think it's very obvious that there, there are many more questions than the, we were able to address, let alone answer here. So certainly a debate that is worth uh, worth continuing amongst us, but also uh, uh, also obviously beyond with all those who are involved in the, in the thinking and uh, designing uh, sanctions. Nonetheless, I found this was a very, very rich uh, and multifaceted uh, discussions. It's thrown up many questions also for me to, to think about and hopefully uh, for those uh, who joined us in the, uh, in the audience. Um, we will have to finish here, I'm, uh, I'm afraid, but I hope there will be a continuation to this, uh, to this discussion. First and foremost, many thanks to Dr. Clara Potella, to Celia Chalet, uh, and especially to Yulia Medvedskaya um, uh, for this discussion, to Yulia especially also for the paper that she uh, that she wrote on the issue, and I encourage you all to take a closer look at that uh, at that paper uh, when you have a moment. Uh, we will certainly continue this discussion also in this format. For the time being, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, be well, be healthy, enjoy the summer, and until soon, of course. Bye then.